Welcome back, everybody. Just finished watching this excellent video by Large Man Abroad, and I just had to share it with you guys. It's titled, Five Reasons Why Life in America Has No Future. Since I've been back in America, and honestly going back for years now, America has changed. It's no longer what it was when I was a kid. Um, you know, it's not the 90s America, it's not the 80s America, it's not even the 2000s America. America's changed drastically, and some people say it's the start of um, you know, the Iraq war, some people will say it's, you know, everything's been in decline since the 2008 recession. But in this video, I want to talk about five reasons why America is going to get worse. And I think that these are more qualitative reasons um, than just kind of something that can be measured, right? These are things that you sense when you're in America. Um, and if you're a student of culture and history like I am, um, the things that are kind of standing out more and more these days. So I think the first thing on the list I really want to talk about is the collapse of family, because it's the cornerstone of community, not just nation, right? Not a country, um, but a community, even on a small scale. Within the family dynamic, within like your, your, your lifetime existing in a family, you know, you go through so many experiences that are shared, you know, whether it's biological things like having a kid, um, I mean, just being raised, <laughs> um, you know, but wa living with loved ones, watching them grow, watching them die. These experiences are things that connect us kind of through time and space. Things have been happening for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, um, and they, they connect us all, right? But especially within the community, because it's from the family and it's from the maintenance, the building and the protection of a family that I think we originally developed concepts like honor, truth, duty, responsibility, trust, love. And I think if we're going to get deep about it, you can say it's kind of, it's the soil from which the soul grows and good families, good uh, familial bonds don't just make good citizens, but they make good people. So with the erosion of the family, with the destruction of a two-parent household, that, that family bond, those family ties and responsibilities, they're fractured. And you know, how can we expect to have good citizens coming up in new generations, or this generation? Because you know, it's been in slow, steady decline. Um, kind of the focus on the single-parent household. You're catering to the emotions of people, because we, we see single-parent households, and we see single parents, and we feel bad for them. But the fact is, when we're looking at um, a nation, a country, a community, right, um, the family serves as a function. And when that function fails, it puts the whole system in uh, detriment. And when that function fails, it puts the whole system in uh, detriment. And I think another one of the key identity points um, that we've lost in this country that I think is only going to get worse um, comes from the job market, right? Right now, we're in a job market crisis. Um, you know, people have jobs, people are working. So you can look at the employment rates and you can say, oh, these are up if these are steady. But the fact is, <clears throat> it's a bit of a cope because we all know that the economy is absolutely trash. We all know that people are struggling, right, to make enough just to survive. You know, that we're, we're a country, we're a people that are in debt, right, even at the highest levels of our government. The country itself, we are in an immense amount of debt. But when we think of our job market, when we think of things like the gig economy, the hustle culture, and the devaluation of the very concept of a career. I think this is still one of the great self-defining parts of our lives, which is our job, our career. You know, you're a fireman, you're a plumber, you know, you're a banker, a CEO, you know, you're a soldier. In lieu of that now, we have, you know, people who are in positions for such short term. And I think that that's real, the real problem. It's the lack of permanence that robs us of our identity. Because instead of saying that I am this thing, this is what I do, this is my profession, this is what my skill set is, because you don't have that anymore, you know, because when you start making too much money, you're asking for too much, you're usually replaced by somebody that's new. You know, the, the skill set requirements are, are kept low on purpose. You know, you can look at unions, you can look at apprenticeships, journeymen, you know, masters. Um, you know, this is something that kind of used to exist within all careers, within all jobs. Right? There was always a ladder that you can climb up, and now that ladder is very short, if it exists at all. And if it does exist, usually it's an illusion because once you start getting close, the competitive nature of America is going to have people find a way to get you out of there and replace you with somebody who won't ask questions. It won't cause trouble, won't ask for anything. And I only see this really getting worse because since we've digitized jobs, we've made people more invisible. Right? When we see ourselves working in a job now, where's the reliance on us? Really, if we're, so easy to re if we're so easily replaceable, we're seen as, we'll see ourselves as redundant. We'll see ourselves as replaceable. And if we're replaceable, in the end, we see ourselves as disposable. And if we're in the position like this, where we can't hold on to a steady job that we're going to grow from, then that leads into the next thing, which is the housing market. 
And you can say it's a housing market crisis now, but I say that the instability of the market has gone to a steady job that we're going to go for, grow from. I've said this multiple times before, but the destruction of American communities has to do with taking localized profits, local grocery stores, local hardware stores, and moving them into the stock market. You can go buy Home Depot stock. You can go buy Walmart stock. You can go buy Amazon stock. All those profits are going to corporate shareholders. So the consumption that creates value in those local communities, all that value gets sent off to Wall Street instead of staying locally. If you had a mom and pop shop and they owned it and they made profits, they took those profits and they bought a house in that local community. They hired landscapers in that local community. They paid the pool man in that local community. They hired a nanny in that local community. Rich people still existed, but the wealth was more spread out in the country. And then that leads into the next thing, which is the housing market. And you can say it's a housing market crisis now, but I say that the instability of the market has been going on for so long. It's not just a crisis. It's not just something that happened because of a little bit of reckless spending. This is something that's been going on a long time. This is something that's done on purpose. We all know that, you know, the stock market and cryptocurrency can be manipulated. Why can't another asset class like real estate be manipulated as well? And I think with the introduction of companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, buying up such huge portions of residential real estate, so much to the point that there's a shortage in housing. And because we've seen the quality of labor, the quality of uh, construction quality suffer, right? A lot of the homes that are coming up now, you know, are really not just up to par to what they used to be just 30, 40 years ago. You know, some of the best houses that I'll see when I go into people's houses are usually gonna be ones that are hundred years old. The house that I just bought has been recently renovated. It was built in 1939. I love this house, right? This is a stable house. And I find myself very fortunate for being able to own a house because I know that a lot of people aren't. I know that for a lot of people now, owning a house is a dream and it's a distant dream. And the old saying is that a person is meant to be the king or queen of their castle. But what happens to a society when people no longer have the ability to have their castle? But growing up, getting a job, getting a house, starting a family, this used to be kind of a fundamental part of uh, the progression to reach the American dream, the progression of life. You know, in any culture, that would be it. But now, the requirements to get into the job market, the requirements to actually buy a house, to get a mortgage are so high that it's practically priced out multiple generations of people at this point. And the question is, is that going to get better? I, th I think the, the answer is obviously no. There's no way it can get better and it's not meant to get better. And that's what I'm saying. The price of housing is inflated, yes. But because it's inflated, does that mean that it's going to come down? Is the value of the dollar going to go up? You know, it, that's only relative to the value of other currencies. You know, the real value of homes is much higher than it actually is because the devaluation of the dollar. When you only see 20, 30 percent increase in home prices over the past few years, a lot of that is being artificially suppressed, you know, and by high interest rates. People look to the new administration coming in and saying that, oh, they're going to cut interest rates. Oh, it's hot. But the fact is, once we cut interest rates, a lot of people who've been sitting on the sidelines are going to flood the market and it's going to increase demand. And with the increase of demand, people are going to be charging higher prices for their homes. So we're going to see the rates. So we're going to see home prices go up again and again and again, just like we saw a few years ago. You know, it's the up down, but it's a trend. At no point in history has it reversed. You might get like a flash crash where, you know, opportunistic people with the means, you know, to, to act and get homes can get homes, but it's going to be really just what you're talking about, what, five, 10% decrease in prices. You know, once the value of these homes is realized, then attaining a home is no longer just a dream. It's a fantasy. It's an absolute fantasy because at that point, the requirements to actually get a mortgage uh, is going to be what, if you have an income of what, 200,000 or something like higher, maybe. So what happens when you have a population and, and they can't own a home? There's no place for them. If they're a perpetual, if they're perpetually renting, your dream of starting a family, your, your dream of what life is supposed to be has fundamentally changed and it's been taken away from you. And the kind of resentment that comes with that has consequences that have to be paid eventually. Right? And, and I think people are very tired of seeing people at the upper end of things, you know, have not just financial control, but moral control. Here's how they're going to get away with it, though. The next generation's idea of the American dream is already different than what it is for us. They expect to be living in affordable housing somewhere, stacked up in boxes, renting. That's their expectation. Our children don't have the same expectations that we do. They'll just be sedated on their iPads and their iPhones. And we were part of a transitionary phase. So we're watching this happen. 
their lives. You know, rise up and say anything about any about rise up and say anything about any of these institutions and count yourself a traitor. Say you're not patriotic, or they call you a communist, or they call you a fascist. You know, there's a whole bunch of descriptors that are going to be thrown on you whenever you challenge the system, or whenever you point out its flaws. The fact is, if you're an American or you're in the greater West, you're suffering. You're suffering and you shouldn't be. So you've eroded the, the value and the concept of family, right? You've taken away people's ability to identify uh, within the community by you know, whatever job they, they usually would be. And now you price them out of home ownership. So this leads into the fourth thing, which is lack of ownership. And I think that this is one of the most defining aspects of this generation, the lack of ownership. And we remember the WEF said something on, on the panel saying, you'll own nothing and be happy. We've moved into that era. You know, that's not something far away in Germany. That's something here, right? When everything is rented, everything is leased, uh, we're, we're a country that's in debt. There are student loans, whether it's mortgages, whether it's car loans, car notes, they call it now, which I don't know why. You know, we're a country without ownership. And that has so many consequences. Because if you can't own these things, then you own no place in your country. You own no part of America. America is no longer for you. Your country, your nation, your community isn't for you. So what responsibility do you have for your country? You know, they say that, they say that the rates of enlistment in the military are very low. If people have no skin in the game, if people have no way to measure themselves or define themselves, why would they put their lives on the line for that country? Why would they? So this isn't exactly a left or right thing. And you can look at it as a classist thing, which it absolutely is. But the fact is, is you have a vast, vast, vast majority, a super majority of the people who've been absolutely disenfranchised. They've been dispossessed. They've been displaced. And the consequence of displacement is going to come eventually. And we can talk as much as we want about population decline and things like that. But, but you know, people exist within a system. Once quality of life goes up and you start putting economic restrictions on people's lives, or you put an economic governor on people's lives that stop them from progressing like they normally would, there's going to be a crash, right? There's going to be an adjustment, and that can be from revolution, you know, that can be from voting. The rise of populism, that's, that's what this is really coming from. You know, the rise of populism is, is a response to all this, these things, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Because I think it's a, it's a natural part of that biological mechanism of in, in being a human to have some kind of say, right? Um, to not just be led and guided, but to actually want to participate and want to be part of something, want to, be, uh, want, to, want to have a feeling of consequence in your lives. You know, all the work that you've done actually means something. You know, not just to your direct family, but, you know, to the, if, if you're living within, you know, a community, a country, a nation, a state, you know, that the work that you put in has meaning. In the military, we say that every person is a cog in a big machine. And, and it's like, and horrible as that is to hear in the first part, because it makes you feel small. It only takes one cog to mess up, to throw off the machine. And there is a bit of importance in that. You know, they used to say bullets don't fly without supply. And it's a silly thing, but there is truth to it. You know, everything serves a function. Everybody serves a function. When you have too many people, and when you've taken away the importance of the jobs, and you've taken away the importance of identity, you know, within jobs and within family, um, you know, you've taken the ownership away. You know, you force people to react. And what we're starting to see now is people reacting, you know, whether it's riots, populist movements. A great example is this healthcare CEO. The healthcare CEO was murdered, which is a terrible thing. But think about when we all first heard the news. Nobody seemed to be surprised. We all kind of just accepted, yeah, that makes sense. You know, you have a powder keg, right? You have a pressure cooker, steam's leaking out, and it can only get worse, really. Um, because there's there's no intention, there's no intention to make things better. Better, because to make things better would require um, some damage to the economy. It, it would it would require you know a, a loss in profits. And this is a country that's controlled by corporations. You know, and it's what America has become. It's a it's a country. This is another reason why I'm sharing this video because the message that he has needs to be spread. And he's a small channel, not very many subscribers, less than a thousand. And I hope that you all go there and subscribe to his channel. I'll put a link in the description. And without that ownership, I think that comes with the last thing that there's no common narrative anymore. There's no common narrative and what it is to be an American. Um, and I think that we're starting to get this in other cultures as well. But I think America is kind of uh, the tip of the spear with this one. With that. I mean, the absolute 
segmentation of uh, populations into uh, competing ethno groups, and we're really starting to see different ideologies canonized into religion. Uh, you know, the groups, they balkanize themselves and they separate themselves from the greater society. You know, it's a, it's a focus on the hyphenated American, you know, to the point where there's no solidarity. You know, it's, there's easy manipulation and corruption uh, because, you know, we're, we're moving back into kind of a tribal big man culture. I want to add a point here. This is something that's been going on for decades, and that is the consolidation of culture. If I make a reference to a movie that we've all seen, like if I say he is the one, Everybody that's watching knows what I'm talking about. Back in the day, there would be local myths and local stories. Only people from your town and your city would know what the hell you're talking about. But now we've got this monoculture where everything everywhere all at once. So there is culture, but it's all been condensed and consolidated down into one because we've all just become one big society. So who are you? When there's 450 million of you, you're no longer unique. You no longer matter. In World War II, people weren't going to defend their country. They were leaving to defend their town. They were leaving to defend their church. They were leaving to defend their classmates. They were leaving to defend their family. Those are the people they were thinking about. Country of common consensus. And I mean, that could just be because our population has gotten so big that the idea of a single body governing almost 400 million people is ludicrous, you know, because they're, you know, very different people that might've existed at one point when we had a common narrative, you know? And you can say that, that to say this is ethnocentric, um, you know, but the reality is, is, you know, America, you can say it's been ethnically diverse and that is true to a degree, but mostly European and European people, you know, share a strong historical parallel with each other, whether that be religious, philosophical, you know, the foundations of their civilization are usually rooted in, you know, uh, the Middle East or the Mediterranean, you know, and that leads and that makes to a very, you know, unique culture. So the early colonies, you know, it was a very unique culture. And, you know, there was a story that started, you know, with settlers and pilgrims and, and, you know, there was, and it was a time of binary, a time of good and evil in the narrative, the grand narrative. And I think with, uh, if I remember right, and don't hate on me, but postmodernism really came the destruction of the grand narrative, right? The focus on the individual, the individual story and the power dynamic. Um, and, I, and I think that this is really gives a, a loss of sense of self. I remember being in Giza and looking at the pyramids, right? Looking at this colossal architecture and being like, you know, for thousands of years, you had families who walked by there and said, uh, you know, our ancestors built that. They did that. They made this thing. Or like growing up in the 90s, everyone had a, a relative who fought in World War II, fought in World War I. And even the stories of battles, you know, that have, having our families all had skin in the game really kind of gave us, it added into that common narrative. You know, that common story of who we are, but now we don't have that anymore. You know, you can, you can say, yes, it's a melting pot. And while I do agree with this, I think the, the narrative of what America was has died. You know, I, I don't think that we can go back to that. I think, you know, I'm someone who says, you know, get what you can out of America, essentially harvest what you can from here and go somewhere else. Um, because this place isn't built for individual success in, a, in kind of a family way, unless you're on the higher end of earners, you know. But, I mean, you can get that other places, especially if you have USD. When I hear so many people immigrating to America and succeeding in a way that Americans usually don't, um, you know, I, I think that the narrative has shifted. Um, and America being a nation of immigrants, right, you know, the, the idea of the 13 colonies, the idea of kind of this uh, Eurocentric American identity, I mean, it's just gone now. I mean, it exists in pockets. And, and I mean, it's romanticized. And it's, you know, my family played a, a part in that for hundreds of years. And it's hard to let go. But every country is like that now, you know, and we're just individuals, so we can rage on the internet about it. But the fact is that, you know, the story of what it is to be an American has changed. But who does it belong to? Does it belong to the immigrant? You know, does it belong to like a person born in America? Does it belong to the corporations? Because at this point now, I think it just kind of exists. It, kind of, it just kind of belongs to corporations and to politicians. And it's sad to say because there's so many people who love this country so much and so many people who for generations have really paid into the system and have really done everything they can for America to become what it has become just to be kind of usurped by corporate interest or by lobbyists. And of course, like I guess there's going to be a consequence to this. So these are really the five reasons that I think America is going to get worse because there's, there's no answer to these things. There's, there's no way that you can reverse these things and set them in a positive direction. But there's a large amount of people who are going to be left out. There's a large amount of people who are being ignored. And the ignored people who are in debt, 
ignored people who are pressured or are dangerous people. And eventually things are going to come to a head. And honestly, I don't have a side to stand on anymore. The American I knew doesn't exist anymore. And it's never going to exist anymore. People who originally immigrated to America for pursuing a better life. And that's why I say, you know, capitalize on capitalism while you can. And get out and find your happiness, find your best life. Because I don't believe it's in America anymore. If you can afford it, it's here. But it takes a lot to afford, you know. The, kind of the traditional American dream in America just is too expensive for most people. Thanks for watching, everybody. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I know a lot of people are struggling right now, especially during the holiday season. I'm a little concerned about the post-holiday layoffs and the lack of work. Seasonal hiring is a thing, and we're going to get hit. The, this, the next couple months are going to be a struggle. Thanks for watching.